Good morning, everyone. It's Marquette Redham and Paul Redham <laughs> with the Homesville Realty Group here in Austin, Texas. And it's Wednesday, uh, which means it's time for episode 36 of Calls with Paul. Wow. And today I'm extra excited because we have um, a special, a special show. We've brought in three experts and architects um, here locally in Austin and um, beyond to share their insights as to how home design may be changing after this whole COVID-19 health situation calms down a little bit. I know that these are such uncertain and unique times that people are spending more time at home than ever before. Your home is not just your home, it's your restaurant, your gym, your homeschool, your office, your playground. Um, it's everything. It's everything. And so I, I was joking around earlier that I know that in our next home, I want a quiet room that's soundproof, not for me, but that I can stick the kids in. <laughs> and so we know that there's probably a lot of people whose wish lists are changing. So we're excited to introduce today our guest. And um, we have with us Brent Spragans. Hello, Brent. Hello. Brent is um, the president and architect of his own firm, uh, Brent Design, and he serves both Austin, Denver, and basically all, all over the U.S. Um, he had a very prominent hand in the design of the Seaholm, um, I don't even know what you call that, the Seaholm Power Station, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and has very been involved for over 30 years now in doing master planning, urban planning on small scale and big scale. We've also got Joel Aldridge with us today. Um, Joel is part of, is it, is it Garrison Architecture, Joel? Oh, no, I'm solo. Oh, you're solo? Aldridge Architecture. Nice. <laughs> Very cool. I didn't realize that. Okay, yeah. awesome. Um, well, he has, I, I've known Joel for many, many years. And back in the day where you were doing carpentry and then came on and did, you know, that sort of blossomed into design and then into architecture. Um, and he has worked at several um, well-known Austin firms before going out on his own, including, is it Tim, was it Tim Cuffett? Yep. Yeah, very cool. So we're excited to have Joel. And last but not least, we've got Dave Burt uh, with Furman Kyle here in Austin. Um, and y'all have all kind of done different things. I know that, that Furman and Kyle has done a lot of residential, but also restaurant and commercial work, which I think is interesting to hear about, yeah. you know, um, that perspective as well as kind of how our worlds may look a little bit different going forward. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just a little bit of housekeeping. Some people are starting to show up on our, uh, on my Facebook page. If you guys will navigate to the Holmesville uh, page, you can, you can see the entire performance. You're, you're going to miss out on the, <laughs> on the real rock stars of the show if you stay on, on that channel. Very cool. Um, great. So let's dive in and talk a little bit about this. Um, starting with you, Brent, you know, um, what, what do you think is going to be at the top of people's home design list when they come out of sheltering in place? Based on what the people I've talked to, I really think the home offices is going to, is going to be a big topic and it seems to stem from comfort, uh, primarily, um, a lot of people, um, are sitting at their dining room tables, are sitting at their kitchen counters. Um, they're in, you know, ergonomically, they're in a bad situation. They, like you said, they don't always have a quiet space to work. If you've got kids at home, they may not have a place to do homework or a place where they can concentrate. Um, so I really think that there'll be a focus on the home office, how we can work from home. Um, I've been working from home for seven years, so this is not that different for me, honestly. Um, that I looks really pretty good up. back there. Is that your home office? This is my home office, yes. I'm liking it. <laughs> so that's the thing. It's making a place that you feel comfortable in and that you can work from and um, and that feels separate to a certain degree, I think is going to be important. Uh, that's what's great, been great for um, my wife, Sharon, and I. We both work from home. We both have offices that are full-time offices, so we can get away from the office even at home. That's nice. What about you, Dave? What are you seeing? Uh, I, I agree with the, the comment about home offices. I think that was already a trend in most of the uh, residences that we design. Uh, I also think there might be a, a gravitation towards uh, more biophilic space, meaning uh, connection with nature, indoor and outdoor, the ability to get fresh air, sunlight deep into the house uh, yeah. so that you can interact with the outdoors. One thing that I, I, ha I don't know that it's a trend, but I would think uh, just from my own experience in my neighborhood is the reemergence of the front porch. Mm -hmm. I think as, 
as this situation has proved, the loss of social interaction um, in close proximity with someone uh, really, um, it, it makes you feel like you want to connect with your neighbors more in a way that you hadn't before. And so at least in my neighborhood, everybody's out walking around, they're in their front yards, uh, talking to one another. So I, I think front, uh, front yard porches or spaces uh, might see a resurgence. That's great. Well, I want to dig into that more in a little while um, about the outdoor spaces and kind of what that might look like. Joel, what about you? What's jumping out as an overview in terms of what you're seeing people are interested in or what you think might be coming? Um, yeah, I agree with both of those. Uh, I think to kind of encapsulate all that, that spatial diversity is going to be a real kind of architectural challenge. Um, whether, whether you're, I, I, I office out of my laundry room right now. So, so it's kind of, uh, which is why I'm outside. Um, it's not a pretty place to look at, but it's it it serves two purposes, um, and I think so. Yeah, I think I think the challenge is going to be how do you make one space work for two different kind of program ideas? So a, a laundry room slash office, or maybe you have some sort of built-in cabinetry that doubles as a workstation that's also part of your you know wardrobe in your in your bedroom or something. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think the challenge is going to be kind of pushing spaces to be more than just uh, a single serving. This is the dining room and that's all it's going to function. It's the dining room is going to have to be, uh, you know, connect to the front porch or um, create a, maybe a, a separate, separate kind of enclave so that people can get um, a quiet reading nook while the other half of the family is watching TV or something. Um, so yeah, kind of just uh, pushing pushing spaces to be a little bit more than just a, a single thing. I think that's great. I wanna follow up on that too later because there's a big difference I think between new construction and how you retrofit existing homes to meet those needs. But um, you know, for us, I'm curious also about home deliveries. If we see any changes there, I think that for example, we've already had seen this, you know, a big reliance on the convenience economy, right? That things are being delivered, whether it's Instacart dropping off groceries or the massive pile of Amazon boxes or whatever you might be having delivered. And now, you know, that was already an issue in Northwest Hills where we li live. There's a lot of package theft off of front porches. Um, and, and now I have this weird system where I'm letting things sit for a period of time and sort of a buffer zone before I bring them into the house? And then how long do I let them sit there before I let the kids open something? Um, I'm curious, you know, um, I, I have a dream that I would love to see an outdoor drop-off zone, right? Like something with a special Amazon lock on it where they can get in and drop packages, where there's a refrigerated zone for groceries to be left so that I don't necessarily have to be home to receive that Instacart delivery. Um, do you see anything with that? Joel, since you went last, I'll start with you this time. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's a lovely dream. Um, <laughs> not in reality. I dream big. They're not yeah. always, big. <laughs> um, you know, i I feel like the trend typically is, uh, the, the big budget clients get kind of a full service design entree and it goes so far as designing a, a, a really cool mailbox and it's, uh, you know, steel and cast concrete and all sorts of different things, but it's a beautiful object. And I, and I love <laughs> the idea of having some, you know, it's a different, it's a different element. It's not, it's not just an aesthetic kind of add on. It's a, uh, you know, maybe it is some sort of insulated structure that you can put your, uh, whatever meal delivery things or, um, yeah, it ser serves a greater role. So yeah, I like- You're telling me that that's on the wish list, but when it came down to actually executing on that plan, that's gonna be cut for budget reasons, is what expensive. I'm hearing. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I mean, maybe it doesn't have to be, you know, if uh, if the deliveries um, become more, I mean, they're already fairly mainstream, but if it's if it becomes a real requirement, maybe that's, uh, that's gonna be placed at a higher priority than, uh, you know, something else. Fancy what tile in the master bed. 
Brent, what do you think about my my idea of a delivery locker? It's um, a giant mailbox. Yeah. <laughs> well, well you know, I think it ties into two things. One, what David was talking about, about front porches, you know, those become more important. You know, it's been multifunctional as well. And um, in Denver, we have the same issue with the porch pirates. And um, a neighbor of mine did uh, basically took a wooden trunk and put it on his front porch. And then there's a, a combination lock that sits on top of it. And when the FedEx guy or the UPS guy comes and drops, they put it in the box and then put the lock on it. Um, super simple, not very expensive, um, but it's, you know, there's a place to do it. Um, my house was built in the forties. There is a milk drop on the back of my house. You know, there's a two way door. So when we did get milk delivery, um, you could, it was, there was a specialty place for it. So I think that there's a, a good likelihood that we'll return to some of that um, specialty design. And um, I think the front porch is key to that. So Dave, am I crazy? What do you think? No, you're not. You're actually uh, hitting on something that we were already uh, doing in a couple of projects. So uh, to Joel's point, you know, we, we have done a lot of custom mailboxes with mail drops and package drops, uh, parcel boxes that are locked. Um, uh, earlier this year, we were working on a project for a client who both the husband and wife worked from home. They have a significant operation um, and, and one of their programmatic requirements for their new home was a shipping and receiving room. And so this, this was a intake and, and uh, the main concern that we had was how do you invite someone like a delivery person in, into your space? It's a larger lot. So how do you invite them in? and know where they're supposed to go without infringing on your privacy uh, at the same time knowing that delivery person isn't going to be the same person from day to day or from the same company so it's not just a matter of providing the space it's providing the wayfinding for them to get from the curb to the drop-off point in a safe and secure manner so there's a lot of troubleshooting things that you have to consider when doing that i've learned some new words already Wayfinding, spatial diversity. Dave, I don't even know what that word was that you talked about bringing nature in the house, but. Oh, biophilic. Yeah. Biophilic. Wow. My, my vocabulary is just. Yeah, but I have to be able to understand you. <laughs> I'm just going to throw them around all the time. Okay, cool. Well, that's great. And we talked a little bit about working on, at home. And, and Brent, you talked about ergonomics. And, um, you know, we're, we were already doing a lot of video conferencing and going live from home. So we kind of have a wonky home studio set up, but I'm curious from each of you and, and Bryn, if you want to go first this time, tell us a little bit about what do you see the need being and how will design address this potential increase in working from home as well as having children needing to be um, productive at home. What do y'all, what do y'all see? Brent, you want to start? Yeah, I think it's going to be a big challenge and it's it's going to be so specific to, to families and how they work. And, um, you know, I, like we talked about the dream, right, is having a, a dedicated space. Um, I think Joel brought up a really great point. You know, the idea that spaces can do multiple things. Um, I think that flexibility is going to be really important. Um, having places that you can can become a home studio. Um, I think technologically, everyone's <laughs> getting a crash course right now. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to see uh, once we kind of get back together, uh, does this continue or how, what, what form does it take? But as far as the, the, the home goes, I, I think a lot of it is just going to be, it's going to be a concentration on how we work and how we do find privacy. Um, and if you can work outside, I mean, we both live in tech cities that have great outdoor cultures. And um, we spend a tremendous amount of time outside. So are there ways to work outside? So I think accommodating that is gonna be a, 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 a wonderful thing. That's great. Dave, what about you? What do you see in terms of the home offices? Yeah, I, I think uh, people are realizing that they don't need as much uh, infrastructure as they used to. So um, we have smaller devices, we have quicker connectivity. Uh, we have the ability to not have to print everything. So there's just a lot of things that we don't need that we used to. And I think it took uh, an event like this to get a lot of people over the hump of knowing that they don't have to be at an office. Um, I think for architects in particular, 
uh, who are used to working in a studio environment, it's really difficult to um, get over the hump as far as knowing that you're not going to be able to just show a sketch to somebody. So I, I know for us, it's been difficult to make that transition to working from home. Uh, but, but if it's possible for us, I think it's possible for anybody. I think uh, the double use of spaces, say like your guest room, uh, is an office as well, or it has a built-in desk, has a Murphy bed in it. I think those are critical. I, I think also maybe having um, a, a space that's actually a destination space instead of just another room in your house might be an option. So uh, let's say you had someone in your family who got sick, you need to isolate them. Uh, how do you do that effectively? And, and maybe that is... Um, uh, playing into the argument of having a separate structure, an ADU or some, a smaller office that's separate that you actually have to leave an enclosed space to go to. And, and for a daily use, say you're using that as your home office, it gives you the sense of uh, disconnecting your uh, work life from your, from your personal life, which I think is really critical. I think we're going to see a lot of people um, being challenged with the ability to separate that work life um, ratio. Interesting. Joel, what about you? Anything different? Um, uh, no, I mean, that all, uh, I agree with all that. The, I think, I think it'll be more, I think it'll be client specific, you know, not, not everyone. I love the, uh, the idea of having a mail room in your house to have, uh, drop off and pick up. That's, that sounds awesome. Um, I think, My garage. huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, as I'm as I'm sitting here outside, I think that the kind of infrastructure will be important, and that's not um, so like your your Wi-Fi capability. Is it? Can you sit outside and still have your signal reach? Are you going to be? You know, what's the flexibility? Do you have your uh, your electrical plan is going to be super important as far as where your outlets are? Um, if you you know, do you have flexibility mounting monitors at different spaces? Those those kind of things. Um, even just to thinking about like our, our architectural uh, construction drawings, you know, noting to have blocking in place if you have for 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 big monitors. Um, so it'll be it. I think it'll be client specific, but it's also as far as I don't know renovations or or. Uh, you know how do you how do you sell a certain space? It'll be important that different areas are can uh, can support those activities. Can support a can support a, ho a home office in different kind of settings. You can be more mobile within your environment. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of you mentioned, Brent, that you've got two home offices. We're fortunate enough to have two home offices. Not everybody does. I'm just gonna throw another crazy idea out there because I I like crazy ideas. So, you know, in, in commercial office space, you have dividing rooms, right? You have the ability to take an existing space and demise it into two or to have walls that collapse and where space can be. Do you see that coming in residential homes at all where you can actually take a space and subdivide it um, or cordon off the kids or what do you think? Am I crazy? Our, who, who wants that our, one? Our kids are lovely. <laughs> and we, we love them, but they they do make noises. And he doesn't do the homeschooling. I don't do the homeschooling, but <laughs> but just to be clear, they know, are lovely. We love our yes, children, we love yeah. our children. Yes. <laughs> the hard thing about temporary structures, and I think there's there is a, a place for them, but um, the primary part of it, I think, as you brought up in the beginning, Marquette, is is sound, and it's really hard with a temporary wall to really create that sound barrier. And open offices, that's been. A discussion and a problem for years so since the, the invention of home of uh, open office space so you if you translate the cube to home um it's going to be difficult but i think having figuring out a way to do flexibility i think hopefully the industry will maybe come up with something um out of this uh, i think it would be great to to make places more uh flexible let's talk wellness Maybe, maybe like some commercial guy could come up with a box that he sends to every employer for his house, you know, that, that, that you just build there and there's your cube. Well, I think <laughs> to uh, Marquette, it's not a crazy idea. And, and I have a, a, a business idea for you, in fact. Imagine, okay. 
Imagine a uh, a sound insulated gerbil ball that's human <laughs> size. So you could just crawl in and uh, and have your little workspace. You don't hear I the kids. I could walk on the wheel. Yeah. Uh huh. Or like you know, there's uh, in the '70s there were some academic architects that designed crazy uh, inflatable structures. So um, you know, maybe it's maybe it's a product rather than uh, something that's part of the architecture, like furniture. I, I've, seen this, I've seen this somewhere. I don't know if it was on Instagram or Pinterest, but those like tiny little one person offices that are clear that mm -hmm. you can turn uh -huh. on. Because yes, okay, I've I, seen, I'm, I've I'm, seen that. I've seen that in you draw it, Joel. Yeah, We're Snuggie. Ready. Maybe the Snuggie. Maybe there's a Snuggie <laughs> that you can work in. Well, there are there are some ways that you could convert, say, a closet space, a coat closet or something mm -hmm. like that into an office space. You take the door off of it, you put a desk in it, maybe you put a barn door across the front of it so it's open to a larger space. If you want to pull up a chair, uh, it's open to the light and the, uh, the rest of the, the common area. And then you want to hide your mess and you slide the door across it and, and you conceal all your paperwork and computer and everything behind that that's one way to do it or having little uh smaller rooms that attach to a larger room that you can close off with a pocketing door it's a lot easier uh to the point about sound uh, and acoustics it's a lot easier to isolate a room through a wall than it is from the floor through the ceiling and so instead of saying like a, a loft space which is harder to isolate acoustically a, a room that's like a saddle bag off of a major room is a lot easier to do that with that's great. I like that. We had we had one like that off of Meriden. But by the way, Joel, the gerbil idea people are liking yeah. online. So <laughs> we, we, we've got a test market out there. And All right. Are... Proof of concept. Hey, the the snuggy term is you know spoken for. <laughs> oh, so let's yeah. talk a little bit about about wellness. So right now, um, our house is kind of crazy. We you know, Paul is going out and showing and doing all the things that we would do to try to keep those, um, everybody safe, both him and, and the clients from wearing gloves and masks and opening doors and social distancing. But he also, I'm going to, I'm going to out you here. He comes home per my request and he strips down in the garage and streaks naked upstairs to our shower and showers before he gets to come interact with anybody. <laughs> It's sort of my favorite part of the whole deal. <laughs> you know, my job is to keep the kids and the dogs away. You know, they like go open doors for dad so he doesn't have yeah. to touch anything while he races upstairs to shower. Um, so I'm curious, you know, and that's just me wanting to, you know, our, our adaptation, our weird family adaptation to wellness and health. Um, Joel, what do you see architecture, how we can adapt, um, whether it is a clean zone or a shower in the garage. I'm just going to add that to my wish list with my outdoor delivery zone. I want a clean zone in the garage or an entry clean zone. Um, well, and, how do you and, see it changing? And is all this going to stick like long enough? Like if, if COVID stuff continues, like I would expect more change if, if people feel optimistic that nothing's going to, you know, we'll go back to normal or whatever, um, less change, you know, like I'd be interested also in like what you guys are hearing in that, in that department from your clients. Um, so, yeah, I guess number one, I think that uh, laundry and mudroom, kind of the, the entry mudroom area has, has become more important in the past, I don't know, so, several years. And, you know, they, they can become pretty elaborate and they can connect to pantries and, um, and, you know, have, have different kind of adjacencies that work out for, for the client. Uh, I think, I mean, I could see that developing into, you know, like, like you guys have, it's, it's a, it's a clean room shower area slash mudroom entry. Um, and then, that dog washing station in the laundry dog, room, mud room uh -huh. is going to be retrofitted to your new, yeah, um, yeah, biohazard zone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, you wonder how, how long different trends are going to survive. Maybe this is how laundry, mud room, entry areas, uh, you know, prolong their, their, uh, their viability as, as it becomes a, a, a clean, a cleaning area. 
you know. And, and maybe it could have package drop off too. Yeah, Dave, what do you think? Yep. What do you think uh, in terms of wellness? Yeah, I, health? I think in the uh, in the early 1900s, the uh, the powder room was an introduction as a response to the Spanish flu, and the powder room was located by the front door, uh, so that your guests would come in, they would wash up in the powder room. Uh, we've seen the powder room grow into other things or disappear from homes. Um, uh, and they're an added cost, so uh, uh, that's understandable. But I, I think having the, say, a mud laundry room, cleaning room, uh, as Joel suggested, uh, they're already prominent, but being close to the homeowner's daily entrance, I know most homeowners don't come through their front door, they come through a garage area. Um, and then having a, a, a wash area, a powder room in, in the vestibule uh, to the front door, close to the front entry. I also think in bedrooms, um, you know, we have a lot of Jack and Jill bedrooms. We have uh, hallway shared bathrooms uh, to bedroom suites. And so I think uh, potentially having um, personal sinks in, in bedrooms could be another thing where you might have a shared shower area, but you might have your own toilet and sink. Uh, so, so kind of like a hybrid Jack and Jill bathroom for, for each individual bedroom would be uh, something that would be interesting. What about you, Brent, on terms of um, not just that, but like air purification, sanitary and safe building materials? What about, I don't know, aromatherapies, um, touchless and keyless entry? You know, um, tell us some other things. If we're dreaming, dreaming big about what design looks like, what do you see? I think that the two that specifically that you mentioned i think are, are the are the are the, the biggest ones with air purification i think is number one um uh, i think you're going to see it in more systems I've, I've already my parents just retrofitted their ac unit and, and just added air purification to their ac unit and um, i think we're going to see it in the market even in builder homes it's going to it's going to become a, a standard um uh I think that, you know, the t I, we were on our way, like a lot of things, a lot of the technologies were on their way. And I think this will accelerate, you know, uh, keyless entry, uh, the idea of integrated systems in houses, I think will, will become more commonplace. Uh, those are relatively easy now with wireless technology to retrofit into existing homes. So I think that the, this will, if anything, it will boost technology that we were already starting to see and bring it into the mainstream. In terms of building materials, you know, I know that some countertops are supposed to have the ability to be more microbial resistant and that kind of thing. Do y'all see any shifts in the building materials? Was that on the cusp? And do we think that more money is going to be directed to, to that kind of stuff in the future? Whoever wants that? Yeah, I, I would suggest that uh, you kind of posed a question earlier about do, do we see houses becoming larger again? Uh, or smaller, maybe we're, we're, we're posed to talk about that question. But I, I would encourage people to consider not necessarily building larger square footage, but spending more of their dollar in these systems. Um, you know, uh, building materials that are longer lasting, that are, are healthier for indoor air quality. I think, you know, you're already spending 30% of your life sleeping in your bedroom and the air that you breathe and that is critical to your health and well being spending a larger amount of time inside uh that becomes even more critical so you know in texas um as we're building closed uh, home system uh, building technology is really important so you know um home uh, air purification dehumidification uh building materials that don't have uh, uh formaldehydes or other vocs um uh, those are all really critical uh you know, I think we like to specify, all, all of us would probably specify materials that are what they are. They're not a material that's posing to be something else, like a, like a, a vinyl floor that looks like wood. You just use wood. Uh, you know, I think there's a, an honesty in materiality that people need to stick to because that's uh, known to be the, the best. Well, Joel, what about? I love, I love that term. Oh, I know, I just wrote honesty, it down. Honesty, materiality. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, I'm going to talk like a completely different person after this. Well, I love it. Um, I guess that's okay. I'm going to pose as an architect. I, I do have, keep going, but yeah. I, do, I do want to bring it back to um, like 
kind of just yeah brent Whatever. like talking about communities in general like and then and then this front porch thing well i'm not ready to go there Okay. I'm, not, I'm not ready to go to front. Porch. Okay, but that's a teaser. But that's a teaser. So talk about what about what about solar power? What about water filtration? What about the ability to be less dependent on services provided by um, your government? Joel, what do you think? Um, going I mean, off grid. Say it, say it again. Maybe going off grid or being able to you know to be where you don't a little bit more self sustaining. Yeah. I mean, it would be great if if. Uh, if thing if this was a motivation for people to be to be more sustainable um you know that's always that's that's the direction i think our profession and industry is trying to move towards um i don't yeah i guess my my first thought was like it's kind of like the uh the the toilet paper disappearance you know how do you you have to connect these you have to connect these things you know how how does the i guess as your systems require more energy you know that's going to imply that your costs are going to go up and how do you pay for those costs so you need you know uh solar or some other alternative systems right. um yeah but uh yeah it'd be yeah sure it'd be it'd be it'd be great if this was a motivator for 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 people very cool anything else on the wellness or health front that y'all think will come out of this i guess i i have one 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 thought i'd uh i guess i'm i'm always surprised when uh it's surprising to me i feel like when clients specifically request request a low voc paint or you know they're they're more aware of off-gassing materials and i think you know, perhaps in the future, that will be more at the forefront of, of people's minds is, uh, you know, what kind of finish is going on these cabinets? What is the, what's on the floors? What's, what kind of paint is this? Because um, to, in my experience, it's been kind of rare for, for clients to really speak up about, about those issues. And it's more, um, on a personal note, we ordered a, uh, a no slip bath mat for my daughter. And it's, probably six weeks old and it still smells like a rubber factory so yeah. careful what you order Be on Amazon. Order. yes that, that happens a lot with our amazon orders in particular uh -huh. um interesting so before we get to your outdoor thing because i think that's a that's a good one um fitness and gyms you know um but you're good with pelotons like everybody's got a peloton now mm -hmm. Where do you put it? I mean, I'm seeing picture your Peloton's in the middle of your bedroom. It's in the middle of your living room. <laughs> Not the most attractive home design feature. Um, how do we see homes adapting to the potential of getting more of our, other than just going for walks, getting home, home, gym. home gyms and fitness? You're going to have them. I, I actually own a Peloton. <laughs> okay. and, and I ride it a lot. And, uh, you know, it's... It, Again, we have an advantage. We don't have a very large house, but we have the ability. We've got a lot of flexibility in our design. We also have a basement because we live in Colorado. But um, you know, I think it's. I think that the the companies that are making home fitness equipment are, are really smart. Um, you know, like you said, they're not the most attractive things, but they're getting much better about how they integrate into our life. You know, there are a lot of products now that don't look like much more than a mirror, but they are a. a, a a, a way to do fitness. I think people are also learning way, other ways to do fitness. They don't have to spend a lot of money for a program or for a, a system that they can, as long as you've got a space um, inside or outside. Uh, and again, we're back to that flexible space. Uh, I think that you can do a lot with very little. Uh, and I think it's pretty exciting. I've never been a big fan of gyms. I've belonged to them in the past, but it's really great knowing that I can do that same thing at home and it's more flexible and especially if you work from home. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have a thought about the fitness in the gym? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we were already seeing that happen. I think every single project that we have in our office right now has a, has a gym, a home gym space in it. And in fact, one that was just an addition of a home gym specifically. I think um, there, there's also uh, something that we've seen recently with uh, golf simulators. Uh, we've done two or three here in the last year. We're, we're working on one right now. And, and these are, are pretty interesting rooms because it allows the person to feel like they're getting out, they're doing an activity. But uh, 
the, the simulators also function for other other sports. So you could do basketball, football, lacrosse. Uh, they have dodgeball for kids, you know, so I could see uh, spaces where people put these in and that's another, just another way to have this interactive experience uh, while getting exercise. Is it just like a giant Wii yeah. room? It's, it's like a big screen, uh, say 11 foot wide, nine foot tall that you, um, it, it has um, trackers on the ceiling and in the floor, infrared sensors and, and, uh, it, it tracks motion and movement direction. And so you, you throw an object through it and it will determine its trajectory and, and then uh, display that on the screen. Uh, so th it becomes a really interactive experience. Wow. That's, yeah. Wow. wow. So it's really a real world simulation. Yeah, absolutely. It's really not the kind of group we normally hang out with or those yeah. people that have golf simulators. In yeah, house. that's honesty and athletics. We need to. We need to. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, what, what about you in terms of um, fitness, home fitness? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that it, it's still a, as I am young in my career, um, it's still a luxury for me to have a client that can, that, that needs a home gym. Um, so, so I guess that's why I'm so heavy on the flexible spaces because you, you know, you, pull something out from underneath the bed and you do your whatever your exercise or you, or you have a, a patio that you can do yoga on um something like that so uh, or, or maybe some outdoor um athletic stuff you know sure. that, that would be far less expensive yeah maybe climbing walls will be more uh will be the hot item yeah it doesn't have to cost a lot of money yeah that's right I think this touches on, you know, urban urban planning and, and neighborhood development um, because, you know, again, as we've seen uh, previous pandemics that happened over the last couple of centuries, you know, that's when we got wider boulevards. That's when we got parks and plazas. And we've kind of gone away from that a lot. And I think in master plan communities, neighborhood cities, we will probably see a reemergence of wider boulevards, wider um uh, walking spaces, uh, more parks, uh, things where people can share those spaces but still remain kind of in a distance from each other. So um, I, I think that that's going to, uh, you know, already you can see a need in our neighborhoods for, for more of that. Well, and Brent, this was something I know that you're very passionate about, sort of the, the, urban, the urban design and the planning and how communities will evolve in terms of their design. Um, I think that's a great, a great jumping off point. What else are you seeing in that regard? It is, there is a dedication to open space and connectivity. Um, you know, I think if there is any silver lining, it's the, the idea that people are realizing how important that connection is uh, to each other. And even if it is from a distance, uh, you know, the, the idea of the front porch, the, the idea of the parade of people down your street. I live half a block from a park, a large park, and it is uh, typically, on Saturdays and Sundays, it's a constant parade of strollers and kids and dogs. And uh, now it's every day. And it's really interesting. Even people are working from home. You see a surge at about four o'clock <laughs> when people are finishing their day. Um, so I think providing that, really looking at how communities develop, how services are local, um, you know, cities that were developed at the turn of the century have more neighborhood zones that they, they work around. So you have services that are close to your house that you can walk to or bike to. Um, you know, cities that have developed slower don't necessarily have that connectivity. So I think that's, that's huge. So I think we will see more of these open spaces will become more generous. They'll become, um, there'll be more frequent. Uh, there'll be more varied. Uh, we try the the projects I've worked on, we try to look at all scales, everything that can accommodate, you know, three people to a hundred people. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot about variety. Um, so I think, that I hope that some of the trends that we've, you know, we've tried to talk about as, as it relates to urban design will become part of just our common dialogue, you know, this idea of connectivity. Um, it's, I think finally, you know, urban designers, we, 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 have an, we have an opportunity to, to do what we've been talking about for 40 years. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. Do you see uh, more alleyways happening to accommodate the front porch? You know, um, 
I, I have, I live on an alley. I love to design communities with alleys. Um, I think they have a lot of uh, uh, great impact. Um, in fact, right now we have alley happy hours where you can sit in your own uh, garage and talk across the alley to your neighbors. Um, but um, it's all, it's been driven by cost so much. Um, I'm a big fan, but the idea that, you know, they sell houses on front foot, you know, the frontage along a street um, and the cost of infrastructure has driven that away from alleys. Um, we are seeing a lot more in infill and in smaller projects. And that's uh, reassuring also the idea that the whole front of your house is not a garage, I think is gives you a chance to have a front porch and have that. I can see where that'd be hard to monetize just like a park, you know, like in, in the balancing act of, uh, do we have a little bit more park land or do we spend the money on alleyways for developers? Um, has to be a difficult uh, uh, thing to balance. When, and you've talked, you wanted to talk about the outdoor spaces that kind of keeps coming up from all of you. Joel, what, you know, we've talked about front porches and being a way to connect to the community. And um, do you see any changes also to our back spaces, your private spaces? What are you seeing there? Um, well, Paul, totally mind linked you. I was hoping that you would bring up the alleys um, because I, because I, I think the, uh, yeah, the, the repercussions on this community scale are, have, have a lot of really positive potential. And I, I love riding my bike down the alleys and it's just a different, there's a different scale that's kind of, you know, if you've, if you've been able to visit like medieval cities in, in Europe, the scale, you know, it's contained and it's just, it, it's such a different space. The proportions are different. Um, and unfortunately, most of ours are, are just for trash, you know, pick up and drop off. Um, but what if that becomes a, a, a more of a uh, amenity that, you know, what if what if the city can put can have a beautify our alleys kind of uh, budget and alleys become more. I love this. The alley happy hour, you know, these kind of. How can we reuse these spaces or or make them more comfortable or accommodating uh, i think is is really exciting i know that the ut school of architecture did a had had an alley project several years ago um that i've it's on my list of things to to look into um but i'm i'm curious where that's if that ever went anywhere or what if there were any kind of uh if anything happened with that yeah, see, yeah. I, I think I over at Mueller, they I have think that'd be a good it's going on pretty well, but I don't see it at a lot of other places. I imagine it's for cost and for, you know, developers to, you know, they're doing it for profit and that's uh -huh. totally acceptable and expected, but, you know, figuring out how to. Well, I've heard y'all talk in. a little bit about not just the alleyways, but like the making sure that your outdoor spaces have good Wi-Fi connection. I know we're spending a lot of time, at least while the weather is still not scorching in Austin, on our back deck, anytime I can get the kids out of the house um, and active, you know, we're, we're, we've done broadcasts from there. We're eating and drinking outside, a lot of drinking. Um, Water. <laughs> lot of, um, you know, hanging out, we're reading books. I mean, it's just so much where, because I know that comes July and August, we're going to be sort of stuck inside more. Um, so anything else that y'all are seeing in terms of the outdoor spaces that any of you want to speak to? Well, I just think people, it's ironic that we've always had spaces. I lost you for a second, Dave. Can you come back? <laughs> Dave, we lost you. Are you still with us? Come in, Will Robinson. Yeah, <laughs> here, but well, hopefully he'll come back in a second. Brent? Either you or Joel, y'all want to speak to that before we get Dave back on? I think shade is, you know, that's especially in Austin, you know, I think that's going to be a, a, a big focus. Um, uh, we just recently, our house, like I said, was built in the 40s, has a front porch, but didn't have, doesn't have an overhang. So we just added two umbrellas, uh, did, put two stanchions so we can put two umbrellas on our front porch. So we just, just add shade. So it can be very simple things I think can really make a huge impact um, on that outdoor space. You know, one of our, um, our guests that's watching has talked about how they had had a budget in place that they were going to do a backyard patio. 
but now they're reallocating that money and they're going to be doing a, uh, a new front porch. Um, of course, this is in Minnesota, so the weather's a little bit different <laughs> up there, um, you know, but, but just kind of shifting those, those priorities. I think shade and landscaping, how does landscape play into that? Y'all see any changes in landscaping? Can you text Dave and tell him? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. The uh, creating shade, maybe uh, um, if we're spending more time outdoors, which I think we should, uh, pri you know, privacy hedges to create these outdoor spaces are going to be more important. Um, I think also planning if for your outdoor structures or, or porches or trellises. Um, Misting systems for evaporative cooling are super helpful, but you want to make sure that you're uh, you're directing it properly, or that your materials aren't going to rot away, you know, after two years of use. Um, Spoken like a true Austinite who needs to be able to be <laughs> yeah. outside when it's a hundred something. That's right. right. <laughs> yeah, and you know, fans. Whether it's I'm doing a porch right now that with a, a wall mounted just kind of fan. So just kind of planning for air movements and uh, comfort is important. You know, it's funny, we have a porch, but it's pushed, our house is pushed back from the front sidewalk a lot. And one of the things we've done, and it's been enjoyable to us, is that we, we now have chairs move forward much closer to the sidewalk. And one of our um, best things is to just sit on that front in the front chairs and just talk to people as they're walking by those spontaneous impromptu conversations um dave lost his outdoor connection if you want me to text him with my watch i have to use my voice <laughs> um, no hey dave we lost you come on in baby <laughs> anyway that that's been one of the greatest things for us we've also um you know we see sort of an alleyway thing and that like we people are getting creative you know we're using our sidewalk as a dividing line and last Friday we had a family because our kids are, are really kind of missing the socialization and we had a family come over and they brought their own pizza and their drinks and they stayed on one side of the yard and we stayed on the other side of the yard and the kids knew they could not cross the sidewalk. Um, and, you know, those kinds of kinds of things, but at the same time. You know, we also have this public zone of our yard, but we also have some private pockets where everything that we're doing is not not necessarily visible. Um, so I, I think that's really interesting to find this. You know, I like the older homes. I like the homes with character and soul and the front porch feeling. And to, to hear y'all talk about how this may be, bring communities closer together again, that we, we want to have more of that front porch connection. Also being able to make our yards more usable and accessible in the back, um, figuring out how to make our outdoor spaces more um, comfortable to be used year round with like a misting system or, or, or good circulation. I think that's all good stuff. Um, anything else that y'all want to speak to? I don't know if Dave's going to be able to rejoin us. Um, your story Marquette, that is such a uh, kind of bittersweet, um, you know, we're, we're somehow we're going to be resourceful and we'll triumph over this, uh, this difficult situation that we've been put in. Um, I think, yeah, we just we have to be resourceful and look out for each other, and uh, I don't know, do the best, yeah. do the best we can. It's hard. I mean, with the kids, for example, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, okay, what do we do? What do I give them to yeah. do to interact with each other that doesn't involve physical activity, you know, touching? So know. They, they did Mad Libs. <laughs> um, they asked each other questions with the magic eight ball. Um, yeah. you know, like you're like, what can we do to engage them in a way, you know, um, that is that is you know, different that doesn't involve physical activity. This is where um, the jungle wheel comes into play. Yeah, yeah. We did storytelling. That was yeah, we did. Good. We did round robin storytelling. I mean, it's just to get creative. Um, we talked a little bit about this, and I see that Dave's coming back on. Dave, are you? Yeah, you know? it, it, it's ironic. We're talking about outdoor connections, and mine went out. So, yes. <laughs> do, you, do you have video that you can turn on, or just yeah? Audio? Hold on, I'm working on it. Oh, cool. here. I had I to move inside to a, to a room that's less than attractive. Hey, we will. We it's will all not... good, man. <laughs> it's part of the new normal, you know. Any Zoom call I get on, so there's a there's kids, there's barking, there's all, that's part of life. And I got to tell you, there's a there's a big part of that I really enjoy, because because I think we're all becoming more human with each other, 
and I, and I think that's really one of the big beautiful things that will come out of all this, you know, like uh, uh, maybe, maybe we start having front porches and we talk to our neighbors again, where for so long we drove into our garages and, and went into our living rooms and all the architecture, no offense guys, but it pushed us to the backyard where we didn't talk to people. And, and the idea of this coming back and having the front porch and getting to know your neighbors and stuff, you know, yeah, is really beautiful. So David, what were you going to say about outdoor spaces and how uh, changes we yeah, might Yeah, I was just saying, uh, I think it's ironic that we, we um, had these outdoor spaces and we didn't, we were, we didn't really use them. And now that we, um, uh, for some reason, we, we have the ability to connect with other people taking, taken away from us, we need that connection to outdoor space. So we, we're actually taking advantage of something that we've always had. And so I, I know that I've seen uh, just in my own neighborhood, the increase of people building um, screened in porches, uh, converting their, their uh, open outdoor patios to screen porches. I've seen several pools uh, being, being constructed here and around the neighborhood and talking to neighbors, it was, it, it was because of this. Um, they, were, they were stuck at home, our neighborhood pools closed. Um, so, you know, the, the temperatures are rising, people are getting outside. They, they need a place to cool down. Um, so I, I think you'll see a lot of people spend more money in outdoor infrastructure um, to be able to spend spend time outside. That, that I'm curious sense. about the new versus existing. We, we touched on that very briefly, but I mean, I think when we're building from scratch, it's very easy to come up. Well, I shouldn't say very easy, but I think you have more flex, you know, there's, it's easier to come up with these flexible spaces and these wish lists. Um, if you're remodeling a bungalow in Hyde Park, Hyde Park and you don't want to lose that charm and character that those homes have, um, or you want to stay within the, the style of a ranch style home in Northwest Hills, how, how do you address these challenges of taking existing spaces and yet somehow modernizing them and making them flexible for modern living? Who, who um, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, I think as far as the aesthetic, um, in, in terms of an addition, I think sometimes, um, and this is controversial, I suppose, some, sometimes it's beneficial to, to uh, ignore the existing context and make something that is either kind of anonymous and disappears or is uh, a statement that's, that's, that's completely different from your existing bungalow. It's probably really client driven, right? Like that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's no, personally, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to go about uh, to, to develop a project. Um, but being open to those possibilities is important. Um, and as far as the existing, uh, you, you know, utilities and structure and construction of, of for example, a Hyde Park bungalow, that's going to be uh, a lot of discussions and coordination with the builder on, um, you know, making making sure that your ducts are installed properly and your insulation is on is 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 done properly and um, yeah, every. I think it's 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 often difficult for for a young architect such as myself to to follow through in construction administration just because our um, our clients' budgets relatively small, uh, so so perhaps this would be an opportunity to say, look, I need to I need to follow through this project and coordinate with the builder and make sure that everything goes as I've drawn, uh, so that there aren't any shortcuts taken along the way, and that this is a a properly functioning, you know, final construction. It's great, great. Do Brent, you or Dave want to weigh in on that too? I think I've seen a lot of, um, I mean, and, and I know this happens in Austin too, but pop tops that are, can still respect the, um, the character and the scale of the, of the original home. Some of them are done better than others. Um, uh, but I think that there, there is a way to maintain that character. I think the most critical thing is, is maintaining scale somehow, even if you do take a more contemporary look at a home, it still needs to respond in scale and context to the materials, to, to the surroundings, I think, uh, and the environment. But I think uh, it, one of the challenges is just, especially in the bungalows, the rooms are smaller. 
Um, the, the homes are framed so that they're all the walls are structural. So uh, if there are ways that you can simplify the layout in an, in an existing home, um, sometimes it takes some structural gymnastics in the attic and some other things, but to be able to create those flexible spaces like what Joel was talking about earlier so that they can be multifunctional. Um, I really like someone talked a little bit about the, having an accessory uh, space. I wouldn't, wouldn't even call it an ADU, but but basically a space in the back of the home that could be totally uh, separate, you know, that could be flexible and serve lots of uh, lots of needs, whether it's for home office, gym, um, place to send the kids. Uh, you know, so and that doesn't really impact you. You can still maintain the character of the home um, and keep that in and do something completely modern as far as. Uh, structure and systems and all that. Um, I think there are a lot of great options there. Very cool. Well, I want to ask, I, I want to touch on commercial stuff a little bit, but just before I do, we were, we were on the wave. Austin was on the wave of trying to adopt um, the new um, land, development. land development code. Thank you. I was losing my words there. And we were definitely looking at a push towards greater density and these different zones. Um, what are y'all, what are your expectations? Do you think that there's going to be a greater pushback against that, um, given our current environment? I mean, we look and we've talked to our friends in New York where they have to get in elevators to go up to their, um, to their condos where the, just the density, the only space that they have to get outside is a balcony. Um, what do you think? Do you, do you, do you see that going anywhere or do you feel like that's going to shift? Dave, I'll start with you on that one. You still with us? Sorry, I think there's there's a movement, uh, you know, uh, going to be away from touching surfaces and density. Uh, you know, um, I have a friend that lives in Manhattan that that has gotten out of there as fast as they could uh, mm -hmm. back here to Austin and is is wanting to build a home here. Uh, I think people are looking for more space, so I see. Um, it not being an incredible density um, like you would find in uh, Manhattan or Tokyo or um, a place like that. I think the density that we have is, is, is pretty good. Even, even when you're talking about the increased density of ADUs and, and what the city wants, that's still more space than what, what is uh, something that's compromising as far as proximity is concerned. So I think affordability trumps, uh, density in, in a lot of ways until you get to like micro density uh, and, and then you're going to start to run into problems. So I think, yeah, I think uh, avoiding things like elevators and um, yeah, elevator buttons and, and uh, doorknobs and things like that. I think you're already seeing a, a, a trend towards um, uh, people prototyping uh, modifications to door handles so that you don't have to touch them with your hands so you're using, using your elbows or some other part of your arm. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, development of, of, of modification to existing things um, that will allow you to have hands-free access to, to other things. I think a return to um, hard, clean surfaces is going to be critical, things that are easy to clean, um, that don't take a lot of maintenance. Uh, you'll see that as opposed to ornate um De decorations, things that take a while to clean and collect a lot of dust. And, and um, it, you, you saw that with uh, modernism at, at, in the beginning of the 19th century or the 1900s, the beginning of the 20th century, you saw clean surfaces, clean materials, hard surfaces. A lot of people thought that was cold, but a lot of it was utilitarian. And uh, that's why hospitals are the way they are. And I think you'll see a little bit of that sterilization uh, might, might trickle back into the everyday uh, life. Interesting. I know that um, we've, we've, this has been fascinating for me. Um, I love design and I love hearing from you guys as the experts. And I know that um, some of you have to go. Um, so I, I, my last question really is, we got to visit with Adam Orman, who's one of the owners of Locadoro here in Austin to talk about the challenges facing, facing restaurants. And I know um, that some of you have had experience dealing with designing those commercial spaces. Do you see any changes in what commercial spaces are going to look like, not just residences, but like our dining out uh, and how we design restaurant spaces and public spaces and things like that? 
anybody want to? That's a really tough question. I think, I think restaurants struggle already to uh, break even, uh, even the high end restaurants. I, I think it's, it's really hard to, to cut down on the number of patrons that can visit. So uh, already uh, uh, dining rooms are maximized for, for um, capacity and, and to reduce that's gonna be really tough on restaurants. So I think what you'll find is maybe an increase of outdoor dining spaces. We already have a lot of those in Austin but I, I, I already just looking at uh, Texas uh, in, in the last day or so and the governor's transition back to what they would, what he would call normalcy, uh, you know, dining rooms are 25% capacity, but outdoor dining rooms are not limited to that. They're limited to the six foot um, uh, distancing. And so I think outdoor dining areas are gonna be critical to restaurants moving forward. Cool. Any Brent, Joel, any other thoughts on the commercial stuff? I, I mean, I agree. I, I expected that uh, outdoor spaces will be utilized more fre more frequently. Or even, um, I was joking with a, a friend who has who manages a a restaurant space that they could. <laughs> there will be a lot of kind of bootleg spaces that. Oh yeah, we have you know we have a greater capacity for, you know than they actually might. But um, uh, anyway, yes, I think I'm hoping that more outdoor spaces will be utilized. Cool. Well, I, any last comments, Brent? Well, I think, any, any I think final? Brent had said, I think, yeah. was that you, Brent? We were talking about like the, the national forest or like, did you have a restaurant thing? I don't remember. <laughs> no, I, did, I, I think that, you know, I think that you'll, we'll see changes to the way restaurants run as it relates to having more to go, you know, being focused on to go. And, um, I think it'll be, it'll be interesting to see uh, this. I think it will impact it. I just don't think we really have any clue what will, what will come out of it when it comes to that. Well, you guys, this has been incredibly enlightening. I, we've had lots of people on as well, and we'll be sharing this information on our blog at homesville.com. Um, I'll give you guys the last a chance to kind of say goodbye and let people know how to reach you because you've got a, a variety of experience here and different levels of expertise. If you guys are looking for an architect to help you with that project, to build you that Amazon drop-off closet, um, <laughs> these are your people. So um, Joel, I know you've got to, got to run. Why don't you just um, sign off and let us know how people can get in contact with you. Um, yeah, thank, thank you again, Marquette and Paul for, uh, for the opportunity. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, my, my email address is simply joel.aldridge.architect at gmail.com. Um, I have a portfolio on LinkedIn and a website to come. Um, and yeah, I have to go watch my daughter. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. Enjoy that. Yeah, Nick, what about you? What's the best people, place for people to reach you at? Um, is it through uh, Furman and Kyle or directly? Yeah, uh, Furman and Kyle, you can reach me at david at fkarchitects.net. Um, you can go to our website, which is uh, fkarchitects.net. And, um, you know, we, we specialize in high-end residential architecture. We do uh, restaurants and other commercial spaces, but uh, I would say 90% of our work is, is uh, residential work. Uh, we do everything from um, remodels, additions to the, the designing mailboxes and other finer things of your houses. Um, awesome. We'd be happy to help anybody or talk to anybody about whatever project they, they have in mind. Thank you. And Brent, what about you? I know that you're kind of straddling both Denver <laughs> and Austin. Tell us um, what's the best place for people to, to reach you. Uh, they can find me on LinkedIn, just uh, under my name, Brent Spragans, or they can find Brent Design on LinkedIn or on Instagram, it's Brent underscore design. And um, I don't have a website, but I, I typically work as a consultant. So I work uh, with developers and design professionals to help them kind of realize vision and, um, and make great places. And so uh, that's where I am. You guys, thank you very much. Paul, any last thoughts for this group of, of, of experts? about? No, I'm just, I'm just so excited you guys yeah. took time uh, to spend with us. All of you guys are really top notch and uh, I couldn't afford to pay the hourly rate. <laughs> Um, of what we've eaten up here today. So I, I really appreciate your <laughs> contribution and uh, you, you guys know how I feel about you. Uh, My pleasure. Thanks for having us.
Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week on Wednesday with Calls with Paul. Thanks guys. See ya.